So this video is all about graphing and best fit line, but instead of using a data set I find online, I figured I'd just do my own experiment here and we'll use that data to draw best fit lines. After I collect the data, I'll show you how to draw a line of best fit by hand and write an equation from that, as well as how to use Google Spreadsheet to do the same thing electronically. So here we go. All right, let's jump to the whiteboard, plot this data, and draw a line of best fit. Here we go. So let's start off with our data that I collected. Of course, after I added different amounts of mass, I saw how that affected the length of the spring. So those are my two columns of data. I need to think about which is my independent dependent variable. Your independent variable always, by convention, should be going on the horizontal axis. Remember, the independent variable is what I change each time. So what was I controlling directly? Well, I was controlling how much mass I added to the spring every time I took a measurement. So I could say I'm adding 20 grams this time, I'm adding 50 grams this time. The dependent variable will plot on the vertical axis here. And the dependent variable is the variable that's changing in response to my independent variable. So I was adding the mass and then I was gonna measure how much did the spring length change as a result of that. So my independent variable is causing my dependent variable to change. So my independent variable here is gonna be the mass I added. And I'm gonna put my units there, all my measurements are in grams. And then my dependent variable, of course, will be the spring length, which is gonna be in centimeters. The next part can be a little bit tricky. I've gotta figure out how do I spread out all of this data over my 12 by 12 grid um, I need to figure out how much each box should be worth on my horizontal and then on my vertical axis. So I'm gonna start with horizontal first. I've got 12 boxes. The mass added needs to get all the way up to, it looks like 200 is my biggest mass that I added. I kind of just do a trial by error with this. If it's 12 across and each box were worth 10, 12 times 10 would be 120. That wouldn't be enough. I wouldn't get all the way up to 200. So instead of 10, let me try 20. So if I have 12 boxes and each one is 20, 12 times 20 would be 240. And that's gonna get me up above 200 without going way, way over the 200. So I'm gonna go up by 20 in each box on my horizontal axis. Now, really important, I'm gonna start by labeling zero on my axis. I find a lot of students don't label the zero, but then they get confused because they won't start at zero when they're like counting over. And so before they get to their first like little tick box that they label on there, it'll be a different distance than the rest of them. And it'll kind of just throw off their scale. It's really, really important to label the zero on your axis. So there's zero, I'm gonna count up from zero. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, let me mark that. Count up another 100 and mark that. I could mark every one of those. It would just make my axis look a little bit cluttered. However you wanna do it is up to you though. Now let's do the same thing for the vertical. It looks like I've got 12 boxes again vertically and I've gotta get up to 15.10. So um, if every box was one, that would only get me up to 12. That's not gonna work. If every box was two, that would get me up to 24, which would work. That goes quite a bit over 15, but I think that'll be the best way to, to label it. I don't wanna go by like 1.5 or something. So I'll go up by two each time. Again, I'm gonna label the zero. I'm gonna have two zeros on my graph. I think it's still just important, label the zero on your graph. So two, four, six, eight, 10, and then 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 right there. So let's pop those points. Here I have zero comma 5.15, 20 comma 6.2, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay, my graph looks pretty linear. It's not perfectly linear, but it's pretty linear. If I saw this kind of curving up like this, then I probably wouldn't do a linear line of best fit. I would use a computer program to do a maybe a quadratic fit or an exponential fit or something other than a linear fit. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw some bad lines of best fit, so you can see some counterexamples of maybe not what to do. So this one might be kind of obvious not to do. Like if I had a line like that, obviously that doesn't really go through the points. That would not be very good. Or if I had this maybe down over here, that one a lot better I think what's wrong with it though take a look at where the data points are compared to the line it looks like I have five points above it and one point below it so that's not very good I want about the same number of points above as below here's another counter example let's say that I have exactly the same number of points above it and below it but that's still not great the angle of my line isn't very good and if you notice the three points above are all on the right side the three points below are all on the left side so I didn't really draw a line of best fit um, because it's kind of angled incorrectly. Ideally, I wanna have the same number of points above and below. I want the above points to be kind of spread out, the below points to be kind of spread out. 
it can go through some of the points, but it doesn't have to. In fact, your line of best fit doesn't have to intersect any individual point. It may, in which case, cool, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes I see students try to force the line through certain points, or I see them try to force the line through zero, zero right there, which often is not the case. It can be, but it never forced the line through zero, zero. So here's my good best fit line that I drew right there and notice some things about it. I've got, it looks like two points above the line, two points below the line, and the points that are above are kind of spread out from each other and the points that are below are kind of spread out from each other. So that's a pretty good line of best fit. I feel pretty good about that. Next, we're gonna write an equation for that line of best fit to model our data set. So I'm gonna start with the equation for a line, which is y equals mx plus b. And I'm gonna write this equation first in just math terms. So I need to label my axes x and y. That horizontal axis is x, my vertical axis y there. y is just a variable, so I'm not gonna substitute any constants into that. I need y to be able to change as I change my x. Now my m I need to replace with the actual slope of this line. So I'm gonna pick two points on the line to determine my slope from. So a really important point, you are not picking data points. Listen to me on that. Sorry, I was kind of harsh when I said that. I'm just having flashbacks to students choosing data points from like the table for their line of best fit. Don't, don't, just don't do it. Because here's what can happen. Let's say you choose two data points. Let's say you chose this point and that point. And you say, you know what? I'm gonna draw my line of best fit from those two. Those two are both pretty close to the line, but the problem becomes we're not getting the equation for our line of best fit. You're getting the equation for this line that I just drew in orange because that's what goes through those two data points. But that's not what we're trying to find the equation for. So don't choose data points. You're gonna read two points off of the graph, not using anything in this table right here. You're also gonna pick two points that are as far away from each other as possible. If you pick two points that are really close, then if you're slightly off and reading the graph, it can, have, it can have a big effect on the angle of your best fit line or the slope of your best fit line. But if you pick two points that are far away, you can be off by a little bit and it's not gonna change the angle very much. It's kind of like this. If I'm off a little bit there, it really has a big effect on the angle. But if I'm off a little bit here, it has very little effect on the angle. So I'm gonna pick this point here. I'm gonna pick this point all the way on the right. So let's calculate our slope. Our slope is rise over run. Rise is gonna be your change in y values, so y2 minus y1. Over run, run is gonna be your change in x values, so x2 minus x1. I'm gonna start with the y value of this point right here, and it looks like it's gonna be about 17.5 or so. And then I'm gonna find my y value of this point over here, about 5.2 maybe, and that'll be my rise or my change in y. I'll do the same thing with the run, a little bit easier in this case, because this point, the x value is 240, and this point, the x value is zero. So 240 minus zero, and then I'll just punch that into the calculator and I get a slope of 0 0.0513. Now that slope actually has units. So let's think about this. This was rise over run. What are the units of our rise on our graph? Well, our vertical axis is spring length, right? So the units of the rise, because we're changing along this axis right here, the units of the rise are centimeters. So it's gonna be 0 0.0513 centimeters, but it wasn't just rise, right? It was rise over run. So it's centimeters over whatever my run units are. And run is a change horizontally. My horizontal axis is mass added, which is in grams. So it's gonna be centimeters per gram. So I'm gonna put that into my equation here. That's my slope. My x is still just a variable, and then b is my y-intercept, so I'm gonna go over to my y-axis here, find the intercept, which in this case happens to be that 5.2 that I measured earlier, that's where it crosses the y-axis. And the units for that, because it's a y-intercept, it's a y-value, well, my y-axis is measured in centimeters in this case, so that's gonna be plus 5.2 centimeters. Great, so that's my equation for this best fit line. And I'm gonna write it one more way because I'm not really interested in just the pure math of it, like X and Y. I'm really interested in the physical quantities. So what are my actual physical quantities? Well, let's use variables to represent those. Instead of Y, what could I use to represent length? Well, how about an L? That'll be a little bit easier to look at the equation. And when I see L, I know, oh, it's length. I don't have to think about what was my Y value? Oh, L, length. So L equals, I'll write my slope again. Instead of X, it's mass added. So I'll just use an M plus my 5.2 centimeters. And basically what this says is for this particular spring, if I add some amount of mass to that, I could substitute in any amount of mass and I can calculate what the length of my spring should be. Now those two values that we substituted in for our slope and our y-intercept, those have physical meanings. Whenever you write an equation in physics, it's helpful to think, what does this physically mean? For our slope, look at our units. It's centimeters per gram. Essentially what that means is then for every gram of mass we add, 
how many centimeters is the length of the spring changing? So if I had one gram to my spring, what's gonna change by a length of 0 0.0513 centimeters? how much it stretches per gram of mass added. Now our y-intercept has a meaning as well. This y-intercept is the length of the spring when m equaled zero, right? It's zero comma 5.2. Well, when m was zero, that means I hadn't added any mass. So really this is the resting length of the spring or the length of the spring without any mass added. So that's how you use a data set to draw a best fit line by hand. Now we're gonna to jump to the computer and see how to do it on Google Spreadsheet as well as on Vernier Graphical Analysis. All right, so I have a Google Spreadsheet pulled up here and I've put my data in there. So that's all that I've done so far. To do a graph and a best fit line, I'm gonna click and highlight all of my data. I'm gonna to go to Insert, Chart. If I wanna alter some things on here, there's lots of options to alter. For example, this says mass added, but really I want this to say mass added in grams, so I can just double click the axes you know, and, and edit those. So let me do that for length as well. I can also change some other things. I can change the font and font size. I can adjust some other things on the graph. For example, um, if I wanted to add some minor grid lines here, then I can make it a little bit easier to read, but also, three sections to get up to 50. It doesn't really go in evenly, so maybe I could change my minor count to four. Then it's like zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Just makes that a little bit easier to do. I could do the same thing for the vertical and I could add some major ticks and, and some minor ticks. I could do some things that make the graph a little bit nicer. But I'm really interested in the best fit line here. So let me do this. I'm gonna go on here to series. And then under series, I'm gonna go down to trend line. I'll click trend line and it'll draw my best fit line. They don't call it best fit, they call it trend line. And it looks pretty close to what we had before. Now it doesn't have the equation on there yet. I can add that equation by going down to here and clicking label and clicking use equation. And it gives me my equation right here. Now it doesn't say y equals, but there's a y equals in front of this. So my trend line equation is y equals 0.0515x plus 5.2. That's really close to what we did by hand, which I'm actually kind of impressed with myself. Good job, me. Now, they're not gonna add any units. They're not gonna add any other variables besides X and Y. That's all stuff that you do by hand, like we did when we did it manually. But if you wanted to save some time and do this digitally, you could do it this digital method and then just rewrite your equation using the actual kind of physical variables like L and M and that sort of thing. So that's how you do this on Google Spreadsheet. Now let's open the Vernier Graphical Analysis app and do the same thing. So now I have the Vernier Graphical Analysis pulled up. If I was using a sensor to collect data, I would choose that option. I'm gonna use manual entry because I'm just gonna take data that I already measured and put it into here. And I'm gonna change my column options. For my Y, I'm gonna call this spring length, units of centimeters. And I'm gonna do the same thing for my X values. Apply. Now, one thing that I'll notice on here is I don't really like my axes. It doesn't start with, it looks like it's at zero, zero right there, but it's really not because this axis doesn't start at zero. So I always come here, I click this, and then I'm gonna edit graph options. And then I like to do my scaling always show zero. And I do that for both my X and my Y. And then now, okay, that looks very similar to what I had before. So the next thing I wanna to do to actually do the trend line is I'll click there and I'm gonna apply a curve fit. They don't call it a trend line, they call it a curve fit. And so I've got a linear. If I wanted some other thing, if this was a quadratic or something, I would choose another one, but I know this is linear. So I'm gonna click that. I'm gonna click apply. And then it gives me this. It tells me Y equals MX plus B. It gives me an M and it gives me a B, but it doesn't actually write those out into one equation. So I would need to take these values and then write out my equation. And I would write out y equals 0 0.05148, pretty close to what we had, x plus 5.196 or 5.2. So I got basically the same thing again, this time using Vernier graphical analysis. Physics pro tip, don't add a kilogram mass to a poor little spring like this. If I just let this go like off the table, this spring would be dead. It would be sad. Please don't kill my springs, kilogram masses. This public service announcement has been brought to you by TPS, Teachers for the Protection of Springs.